let me introduce uh, our, our panel. Uh, nearest to me is Enda McGuain, uh, Vice President of the Society of Chartered Society, uh, CSCI. Uh, he is the Asset Management Lead with the Land Development Agency. You'll be aware that that was one of the kind of uh, big bazooka uh, measures of many governments to get state land across a whole spectrum of different uh, owners into housing and development and to cut through the red tape. Uh, beside him is Dr. John McCartney, Director of Research with BNP Paribas Real Estate, and uh, I'm losing count of the number of universities that you're linked with uh, in terms of research, the RPT, and so on. So a real brains uh, uh, trust. Um, then we have uh, one of our key sponsors from I3PT uh, certification, CEO and founder, Owen Leonard, uh, and, and uh, obviously an expert in new regulations, all relating to environmental sustainability, what it actually means for design, what it means for new build, and what it means ultimately for valuations, those that comply with those changes and those that don't. And last but not least, uh, someone I've known for over 20 years, Pat Farrell has a vast reservoir of knowledge but direct experience in both the political and banking sectors, and of course is now the CEO of Irish Institutional Property and representing uh, a lot of very large scale investors in the Irish economy. So perhaps I'm going to start by allowing you, as this is a kind of overview, post-pandemic, the trends, the outlook, as you perceive it. So I'll start with you, Pat. Um, a lot of uncertainty, a lot of negativity in the macro environment. You heard there, REITs, valuations gone south, uh, first time in maybe a decade. Um, how does the world look to you vis-a-vis uh, -vis 2023? And in terms of your intray, what are you most concerned about? Yeah, well, I suppose um, picking up where Connell uh, left off, uh, speaking for the, the investors that I represent, they're, they're backed by big institutional uh, investors, pension funds in the main, <coughs> and they have, they're globally diversified, they have big balance sheets, so they have the ability to look through the cycle that Connell talked about over the next 18, 24 months, and despite that kind of interest rate volatility, which obviously will settle or is settling, they, they can substitute more equity in, in place of debt, so they have the ability to, to get through there. The other thing is they're already very committed to Ireland. Since 2010, like, they've, they've invested over 25 billion in the Irish market. So they're, as I say, they're, they're not half pregnant here. They, they are in, in for a lot of investment in this, in this market. And they're needed as well because if we look at Housing for All, which uh, has the, the targets that it has over the next five years, the government's own analysis show that over half of that or more, two thirds of it is gonna to have to come from institutional investors. So, I think they're here, uh, they're, they're committed to remaining here, but there are qu a number of issues um, on, on the table that we need to address. And, and the first one is in the PRS sector. Uh, we have a rental cap of 2%, it's a crude cap. Uh, we believe that there is a political reality that there has to be a rent cap, but we believe that it needs to be tweaked to enable uh, landlords, uh, be the institution or smaller landlords, to reset to the market price when they're renewing a tenancy or bringing a new tenancy to the market. That's number one. In the absence of that, it's hard to see how you can make an investment case uh, for the PRS market because all investors, small, medium, or large, they invest in that market as a hedge against inflation. So if you're capped at a crude 2% and inflation, headline inflation is 8 or 9%, it doesn't make up to an investment case. The other issue is our planning system. It's very broken, and we know that the government is committed to reforming the whole legislative basis, uh, but that has a real urgency about it because at the moment there are about 35,000 units trapped in the uh, appeals process or judicial review, uh, which are badly needed because of, of the need to get deliver numbers in the housing front. Uh, and I would agree with Carl. I think that the numbers will, will obviously uh, be good this year in terms of housing, ba based where we're coming off. And I think next year they'll probably hit the figures. But there is a big, big question mark over 2024, which, as you know, is an election year and the election will probably be no later than October of 24. Uh, so uh, the problem there is a structural problem in the pipeline uh, because uh, of the pipeline of permissions that are there at the moment, about uh, at least 60% uh, of that is apartments, 
and there's a big, big viability question hanging over apartments at the moment. It's been there for quite some time, but it's now more acute. And if that viability issue is not resolved, um, then there is a real question mark over the, the ability to deliver the numbers that are baked into Housing for All in 2024. Just on the PRS one, uh, what I picked up when I chaired the CIF annual conference was four big blocks of apartments. The business model was cheap money and rising rents. Now it's expensive money and frozen rents. And it, it, it seemed that the queue of funders for apartment blocks to buy them lock, stock and barrel was starting to dissipate or disappear. How bad could that get? Because, you know, within the supply side, the one success story has probably been denser type development in Dublin. I don't know if apartments are viable outside of Dublin, mm. uh, and that's another question. I, I, I mean, are you seeing your members saying, look, we can invest in better things, we're, we're out of Ireland, or do you still see a pipeline of PRS? Well, you see, on the plus side, the fundamentals are really strong still in Ireland relative to other markets. So we still have a huge gap between supply and demand, and that's reflected in, 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 in what we see in terms of rentals. But so long as there's a cap there, an absolute cap of 2%, um, and I, I'm not going to rehash what I said already, that's, that's a real, real way, negatively weighs very strongly on the, on the investment case for PRS. That said, selectively, there's still investment in PRS developments. We can see them around the city here, and, 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 and they're happening, but it's on a much more selective basis, and that 2% cap is a real overhang at the moment. Uh, about 25% of your members' portfolio is, is, is resi. Just a word on post-pandemic working from home, online shopping. Uh, what are you seeing in the commercial trends? Yeah, it's, it's more than that. It's probably 35%. But yeah, we're across hospitality, leisure, office, logistics, um, the whole thing. Um, on, on the office side, I think uh, it's interesting. I heard the new mantra in the United States now is work from work. So I think that... Uh, you know, still... Sorry, say that again? Work it's from work. I don't understand As that. in, you know, the place to be at, to at work is in the office, right? <laughs> yes. <laughs> um, I, I think that there's some things happening, certain things happen at the moment. For example, I think with the looming recession and the fact that, you know, you're seeing some sectors hit with employment, I think em employers are more in the driving seat now. Uh, and in the past, they were standing back a bit and, and not keen to kind of assert themselves in terms of getting, accelerating that return to the office. But I think that's underway now. Um, occupancy is beginning to, to tip up. Um, and the other issue is for employers is that, you know, if you're going to have people in the office three days a week, you can't hand back the three days of Monday and Friday to the landlord. So it's a fixed cost for, for, uh, for employers. So they need to work that asset. And I think the trend is going to be more and more towards, uh, I still think there will be uh, flexibility and we will harvest some of that flexibility from the pandemic. But I think the trend is more now back, swimming back towards uh, working in the office. And, um, you know, we don't have a huge overhang of supply in the Dublin market at the moment, but that said, the vacancy rate has, has gone up, and I'm sure there will be some revaluation as well. Uh, but, yeah, I think okay. there's... OK, well, ju just on that point for continuity, could I go to you, John? Because, you know, this is your space. Um, it seemed a bit rose-tinted, what Pat was saying there. I was detecting more of a nosebleed. In the office? In, in the commercial, in the office space, and the retail space, and that, that it was undeniably, as seemed to be inferred by Connell, going south in terms of valuations and demand. Yeah, I think Connell has done a good job, really, in setting the scene in terms of the monetary impacts. So when interest rates go up, it has two effects on property. First of all, um, other, other competing asset classes, particularly um, fixed income products become, relatively speaking, more attractive because the returns go, go up. And so the yield on property has to move out to remain attractive. So that puts pressure on values. And secondly, debt service cover ratios to be preserved. Um, you know, the, the result is that, that lenders will extend less debt capital and buyers simply have less capital to deploy when they go and compete for, for assets. So I think unless rental growth can compensate uh, for the outward movement in yields, uh, then values are inevitably going to fall. And uh, I think looking across the sectors, uh, I wouldn't have faith that uh, we can see rental growth 
um, making up that gap. If you look at, at retail, uh, that sector has been enduring a sort of a, a, a long-term structural arm wrestle for the last 15 years. Uh, offices is um, slightly different. I mean, we do have this um, working from home phenomenon, which I think really we don't know what the long-term implication of that is going to be for office demand because uh, office leases tend to be long leases and so it takes a long time before companies can respond to a shock and right-size their office space because they're locked into long-term leases. So I think we'll have to wait and see. But for now, what we've seen is that the amount of space per employee uh, has, has fallen. It was well over 13 uh, square meters per employee in Dublin uh, prior to the pandemic, and now it's come back to below 12. So, um, you know, I think... I Could I press you a bit more on this? Because what are the fundamentals? Like, when we talk about housing, population growth of a million over a decade, so therefore, you know, 35 or 50,000 units are required. There's pent-up demand. So the fundamentals are pretty strong if we could deal with planning. And, and What are the fundamentals of the office and retail market? In other words, is it oversupplied, both, or is it undersupplied? Well, it's, 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 it's straightforward, really. Back in the day, you would use a sort of a simple rule of thumb that um, for every additional uh, service sector employee, it, it would result in somewhere b between 10 and 13 square meters of additional office space being consumed. And the difficulty with working from home is now that is challenging that long-term rule of thumb. It may be because companies want to only bring people in three days a week and they can develop a roster system. They can get away with a smaller office block and therefore the ratio uh, or the, the read across between service sector employment growth and office demand is, is disrupted. No, I get that point. It was more on the supply side. You know, you look around the former Ballsbridge Bank site, you yeah. look across Dawson Street and other places, and you see lots of cranes in Dublin. Is there a glut of supply coming to the market, or is it in equilibrium? Yeah, I, I, I would be loath to describe it as a glut, but it is a cyclical peak. So, in other words, because of the lead times in construction, uh, buildings are coming to fruition this year and next year uh, that were planned before we'd even heard of COVID, you know, and so the business decisions taken back in 2018 and 19 are now leading to a rollout of offices this year and next. So to put the numbers on it, uh, Ivan, uh, we're going to build about 220,000 square metres of office space this year. Now, the question is how much take-up is required And to next year? Would you say something, something? something similar, right. yeah. And my question... So it's a significant extra capacity. It is. And re realistically, you probably need 400,000 square metres of take-up to absorb that 220,000 square metres of additional space in each okay. year. Because, and retail? Retail because, in a word? So, sorry, Ivan, just to ma make the point, because a lot of the movement that we see is movement within the market, and if you're vacating space to take new space, sure. the net effect is much less than the gross take-up. Okay, and retail in a word? Yeah, I think retail uh, will remain under pressure. We've seen uh, con um, retail sales falling you know, consecutively now for six months. Um, I think there will be certain sectors that will continue to uh, perform reasonably well, those being the defensive ones of grocery and neighborhood and convenience uh, shopping, but fashion, um, high street um, and, and to a lesser extent shopping centres may, I think, remain under pressure. Okay, I want to pivot to you, Owen. Tell us first of all what I3PT certification means and how it's relevant to this audience. Sure. Um, first and foremost, um, I3PT is what happens when engineers are put in charge of marketing. Uh, it stands for independent <laughs> third party testing and okay. the, the basic function of the business is to work with uh, investors, developers, uh, and occupiers in, in the market to make sure that the impact they have on the built environment is, uh, is sustainable and safe. Okay, so we work with everybody from the LinkedIn's of this world and the Facebook's and the Microsoft's to the large investment funds like BlackRock and, and, and major developers. Uh, so so you're the friendly face of compliance, really? We are, we are. Okay. So how, how does that work? It's just more cost, is it, or what? No, no not necessarily. <laughs> so I suppose, the, I suppose one of the th themes we're looking at here today is the trends affect the investment, Ivan, and I think 
for all of the flaws of economics, I think there's one thing remains pretty constant, that if something is incentivized, it's more likely to happen. And ESG is probably the biggest trend we're seeing impacting on real estate investment right now. I was in London yesterday, and I was speaking to Mark Ridley, who's the global CEO of Savills, and he said it went from being a, an item on the agenda to the top item on the agenda for all of the investment management firms that they're, de they're dealing with, and for all of the financial market participants that de they're dealing with also. And there's a number of reasons for that. It's not just because it's trendy, um, and it may and will add cost, but it's because in the current situation we find ourselves in, where inflation is happening and, and finance is getting more expensive, ESG offers, uh, first and foremost, very, very attractive capital inflows for genuinely sustainable financial products. I think we've seen in the past nine months something like 33 billion flowing into Article 9 funds. There's been an outflow, actually, on, on Article 8 funds, which are lighter green and not, not necessarily as, um, as reliable uh, from uh, a sustainability investment perspective uh, based on the, the, the recent clarifications from the EU. So firstly, it's an attractive asset class. But beyond that, you can attract a, a cheaper cost of capital uh, if you're a developer. So in, in, the, in the case of inflation and rising construction costs and everything else, every 1% counts. Uh, and that's a significant driver. But the, the other major driver we're seeing is with occupiers and with other institutional capital, corporate sustainability initiatives are driving behavior in terms of people who want to purchase or lease or, or access this type of property. So it's a bit of a perfect storm, right? And there's no do nothing scenario. And I think that's what we're starting to see is that the vast majority of investors are leaning towards ESG positive investments. And is all this for new buildings or is there a retrofit element to it? There's so say you have a big property portfolio yeah. already of offices, of resi, of whatever. Is there something about the SFDR, the Sustainability Finance Directive, that applies, or is there grandfather rights, to use a term, you know, exemption or whatever? You know the way all eight new buildings have to be A-rated, yeah. and the target is 3% a year at EU level retrofit, and we're nowhere near that, it's less than 0.8%. So is this actual and real for the built environment? Sure. Well, firstly, you mentioned SFDR, so I'll, I'll reference the uh, companion piece, that which is the EU taxonomy. And the EU taxonomy treats new construction, acquisition and ownership of existing as assets, and retrofit, retrofit or renovation of existing buildings slightly differently. Okay, but it's all driven towards the 1.5 degree or, or under 2 degrees um, energy increase or temperature increase. So the, when I'm looking at new construction, there are specific rules you have to meet if you want to align with the taxonomy, and that is in an Irish context, not a massive leap. For all of the bemoaning we've had of building regulations in this country for many years, we do have a fairly high standard. I can say that in a pan-European basis, we, we have a very, very high standard of our built environment, which actually makes us a lot more competitive when we're competing with other European nations for, for built assets. Um, so the, the, the leap between our current building regulations and climate change mitigation, which is the, I suppose you could call that the gold standard in terms of environmental objectives, is not a massive chasm. In fact, we've seen multiple, multiple developments in the Irish context in the last 12 months reach that, that, that um, limit or, or, or that, that ceiling without a, a significant amount of capex or without any capex at all. Right? So first and foremost, it's not a big leap to get there uh, with new construction. Existing assets is a much bigger challenge. Uh, to meet our 2050 targets, Europe needs to renovate 3% of our building stock year on year. That was two years ago. Right? We're currently hitting about 0.8%, and the level of retrofit is not significant enough. So the amount of retrofit that needs to happen is, is going to be significant over the years to come. We're going to fall short of the 2030 targets. I think there's no doubt about that. Um, and we're going to have to see significant so intervention. So what? I think, there's I no think, fines. <laughs> well, we're, not, we're, we're only going to have 150,000 cars instead of a million cars. Yeah. Agriculture won't get halfway there. So what? And again, if you, if you, you can only take this sector by sector, but take Paris. And Paris have introduced new legislation in the last few days which will effectively disrupt your business model if your buildings are not efficient enough. You will not be allowed to lease or sell those buildings unless you actually improve their energy performance significantly. And it's a burning platform. That's going to change year on year on year. Now, Paris have a particular problem with the way they've, they've constructed their assets over time. There's a, a particular type of architecture which is, makes it difficult to renovate. Um, and, and about 55% of their residential portfolio is is pre-1950s. Uh, and, and should I just say, we're having a fireside chat this afternoon to take sure. a deep dive into that, mm -hmm. yeah. and we have a panel on sustainability. I will come to you, Pat, but I just want yeah. to bring in Enda here. You have two hats on. 
you have the Society of Chartered Surveyors in Ireland, uh, Vice President, and you're the Asset Management Lead on the Land Development Agency. I remember back in the days of John Moran and the huge excitement several years ago about the LDA, and I'm just wondering how it's all going. And secondly, maybe give me your perspective with both hats on where you see the market for 23 across all the property divisions. Okay, uh, well, look, starting with the LDA perspective, it's, I suppose it's like John talked about, there's a long leading time in certain developments. Having said that, the LDA at this point in time under Project Tusk has launched affordable housing for sale, both in Cork and Waterford. Uh, first cost rental product was launched this week, lining up the LDA to probably become the biggest supplier of cost rental product in the next six months in the country. What sort of numbers are we talking about? Uh, in terms of the f units. Project Tusk, you're looking at a thousand units per annum, that's the target for, and that's been achieved at this point in time. Uh, that's the shorter term, that's something from a deployment perspective that started 15 months ago. The longer term, obviously, those bigger sites that you talked about in those state lands, and obviously, I think 10 days ago we had the launch of Shangana, which touches on Owens Point. It's going to be one of the largest passive housing developments in, in the world. Uh, it's going to be designed to be efficient uh, as a site in terms of use, but also in terms of affordable housing and cost rental on the product. So I suppose the pipeline is moving. Obviously everyone wants the pipeline to move faster, but deploying large scale sites and taking ownership of lands, the LDA is constrained in the same way that everyone else in the property sector is by moving through the processes that have to be gone through, both planning, viability, research and financing. So would you see as we go through the 2020s, sort of three, four, five thousand units a year would be a realistic LDA? I think what you would, I, can, I can see from the, the number of months that have been in there is there's a huge amount of work being done, for want of a better word, under the, under the uh, non-visible work in terms of preparing that pipeline. I think the pipelines that we have out there to get to six, seven thousand units will start to deliver over the next two years, starting with Shangana, then you move on to Devoy Barracks, you have St. Kevin's and Cork, there are three big sites. There are other sites, I suppose, in that process as well. And it's just, it's the best way I could describe it is going to be a bit like the Titanic. Once the ship gets going, it will start to deliver in big numbers. But it's deploying from a, a, a scratch perspective four years ago. I think that someone described it to me as there was two people and one laptop to go into an organization is today to deploy assets. It's, it's been a big transformation. And with your other hat yeah, on, yeah. what's your perspective on 23 across the various markets of Resi and commercial? So I'll pick up on a couple of themes. I think Connell mentioned early on, he was quite right in terms of the challenges and the, the price discovery that's happening in the residential market. And obviously our agents in the SCSI would, be, would tell us that following the interest rate increases over the last number of months, they've seen quite a few sales fall through. And these are transitional sales, people trading up because of the, the impact that's had on them. And that's going to result in the second-hand market seeing prices come back, uh, call it a regularization or a discovery. That's definitely imminent and ongoing at this point in time. Uh, from a viability perspective, particularly with the apartments, I know the SCSI are doing work right now on the cost of building report again to update it. Uh, most recently, we guided tender price inflation at 14%. I suppose essentially the work now is trying to explore what has happened in the last three years from a COVID, from a Ukraine, from an inflation perspective. What impact has that had? So what I mean by that is three years ago, the price of construction, give or take for a new apartment, 48% of that was construction. The other elements of, 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 of cost in terms of planning, levies, VAT, tax, all the other elements brought up the, the, the remainder. Uh, the question mark now is how much of that has changed, what levers can be pressed, I suppose, to influence and bring down those prices. And I suppose the last element of then is, is what's the overall pipeline looking like. Uh, and I suppose finally then from a third point, one thing we do see from a valuations perspective, and again it's the talk to Owen's point, the whole area of the taxonomy and sustainability is, is, has been heightened by the inflation prices in energy that we've seen. People are now much more conscious of the cost of running a residential or commercial building. Valuers right now are working on methodologies probably aligned to UE taxonomy where every product, be it residential or commercial, will have a consideration for that, how it performs. So the days of maybe a product that is certified to a certain standard, that's all great, we accept that's the level it works to. They're changing. What we're going to see going forward is valuations will be based on performance. So what is the asset performing like? What's the energy it's using? How has it been maintained? And those factors will impact on valuations into the future. And I suppose it's John's point, lastly, you will see a premium emerging, which it already has at this point in time, for grade A office space, but grade A office space that's performing. And similarly for A rated homes or B rated homes, but ones that are performing to that standard. Just going back to your perspective on housing, if you look at the pipeline of planning permissions, mm -hmm versus commencements, you'll see there's a large swathe of apartments not being built. 
And the business model of an apartment is you can't sell your first apartment until you've finished your last apartment in the block, whereas you can, you know, build in, in rounds and rounds yeah. of 20 houses, another 20, and so on. I think a lot of young families don't want to live in apartments outside of Dublin. Is there not a fundamental dichotomy between those who talk about housing and those who build housing that a lot of these apartments will never now be built? I would think that it, it depends on the original design features of the site. So everyone in this room is aware that from a planning perspective and from a density perspective, in many instances, apartments are put onto residential sites to maybe achieve densities. That's one factor that's been consideration. And the number of those apartments and the viability of the scale of the apartments. The larger, obviously, number of apartments you have from a, an ownership and operations perspective, the more viable they become. In terms of the construction piece, I think it very much depends on location. I would disagree with what you say in the sense that families don't want to live in apartments. Uh, the interest we have done from our behaviour and attitude survey will indicate that if the price is right, and if the location is, is right and the amenities in that site are right, families or, or young families in particular view them as a, a good place to live. There's a different demographic out there from my perspective. But you don't have a pet or a garden. Pardon? You don't have a pet, usually, in an apartment, and you don't have a garden. And kids like to kick a ball. Absolutely, and I'm three of them myself living in an apartment right now. And, but if the amenities are right downstairs, you have that space that can be utilised. And I think that comes back to you know, some of the work that the LDA is doing in terms of those larger sites. It's not just about putting 600 units on Shangana. It's about master planning the whole development and taking the approach of how will people live there sustainably and in the long term. And how can you address the transport, the pets, uh, the, the amenities elements, and the education piece. So I think one other element that's probably noticeable quite right now the LDA have launched Project Tusk Phase 2 uh, of expressions of interest in the last couple of weeks, and we have seen a huge number of apartments coming through that pipeline, into that process towards ourselves. I stopped you there, Pat. You wanted to come in. No, well, I, um, I wanted to comment maybe on what Owen said, but to just pick up on what was saying. I mean, in terms of apartments generally, the space standards of Ireland versus Europe, post the crash, we brought in regulation standards in apartments, which means they're about 10 to 15 percent higher than the, across Europe. And the legacy apartment situation in Ireland was certainly um, much smaller apartments. There was no regard, very little regard for amenity or placemaking. But everything that's been better since post the crash, the space standards are high, the quality is very high, and you have very high regard for amenity and placemaking, which addresses your issue about wanting to kick the ball and, and, and have all those kind of recreational amenities. So I think it's important to make that difference. I think on the viability issue, the government has some policy levers it can pull. Um, apartment development in Ireland at scale was never viable um, except actually in the 80s where there was effectively a 40% subsidy via Section 23. Um, I think policymakers may be, may be shy to go there again, but there is the VAT input. I mean, government between VAT on professional services and on hard costs is, has a blended rate of about 18% on costs at the moment on residential. So I think the government needs to consider pulling some kind of a policy lever in that, in that respect. Going back to what Owen said on ESG, ESG may have been historically a touchy-feely subject. It is most definitely not. There's a very hard edge to it. The regulatory and compliance train has left the station and is gathering pace, and it has implications for everybody in real estate in this room, because funders, be they debt or equity in the future, are going to look at your portfolio, and depending on how much you're going to have to invest in it to get it up to the required standards, or the quality of it, that will affect the bid price they will make on that portfolio. It will even affect whether they even are interested in investing in it in the first place. And this is something that is now coming up high on the agenda of everybody in the real estate sector, and people are going to have to get with the program. Uh, and for those, and the members I represent, there's a lot of recency in their stock because they've built a lot of new stock in office, hotel, uh, across, and housing as well. Relatively speaking, they're in, a really good, they're in a pretty good space because they're already well on the journey to net zero carbon. But for those that are more legacy and older stock, they're going to have to start thinking about the investments they're going to have to make to get themselves on the journey to become compliant. And that compliance agenda is building. Um, just a question on the Slido. Uh, any thought, this is beyond my pay grade, any thoughts on CP145 final guidance issued by the Central Bank on leverage rules for real estate funds and possible implications for investors in Ireland? Anyone want to take that? Yes, okay. Yeah, I mean, the Central Bank's initial proposal on this was that they were going to impose a 50% leverage. Uh, in other words, no more than 50% debt. 
uh, and they were also saying, or there was an, a sense that it was going to be brought in from a, a hard start date. What they've now done is they've brought that cap up to 60%, which is welcome, and they've also provided for a transition. And I think the transition is important because otherwise um, the thing that they were saying they were trying to prevent, which was a triggering of a market event where somebody would have to sell assets in order to get the liquidity to comply with the leverage, uh, that, that sort of helps to mitigate that because it gives people a chance to get there. So I, based on what they were initially proposing and what they eventually tabled in their, in their recent statement, I think uh, we would have made the case on both of those things and I think would welcome the fact that they acknowledged that. Uh, so I, th I think it's in an ideal world, there's lots of other things you'd be looking for, but I think they were two important considerations. Um, final sort of question I want to ask you all is, uh, what's your ask of government? Insofar as we've talked a lot about the market and we've talked about the EU, but you know, I've seen figures that in a normal residential market, around 30% are investors getting in and investors getting out. We've well over 30% of landlords, smaller landlords fleeing the market, and someone says to me, Ivan, go figure, marginal tax, 52%. I'll do something else with my money, throw in eviction bans and rent caps, and that all comes back to government. Um, we have housing for all. It looks like it's going to deliver less next year than this year. We have supply problems and different alibis there. If, 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 if we're looking to 2023, and you've heard the depressed nature of the market, is there anything government can do to make all the property sector better, either in the total tax take on a residential unit, new of 40% of investment returns? To think. Does anyone have a comment on, on government? Or are you conflicted being working for them? Or? <laughs> I'll use the essays I had. I'll take that. Okay. Away. And I think what we all want to see, and what's been called for before, is, is, is consistency and, I suppose, data-driven response. I mean, I, four years ago, I sat here. Rosalind Carroll was the head of the RTB at that point in time. She flagged, or she highlighted, the concern about, uh, about people leaving the marketplace, particularly the, those landlords. And I suppose what we've seen, and let's be honest about it, as, as an industry for the last 15 years, property construction, there have been certain approaches made to it. It's very popular to talk about it and to comment about it. I suppose what we need to see is there is reliance on data, and I suppose from information provided by the likes of ourselves, the surveyors, from the economists in the room, uh, and I suppose that we use that data to drive policy. That's what I think. And that data exists where? I think you've got the likes of the apartment construction reports that were produced a number of years ago by the society. You now have the RTB producing detailed analysis of where our rents are, as in actual paid rents. Now, that's not a perfect system, but we're getting to that point. But I suppose it's the ability to use that data and to project out into the long term. I mean, let's be honest. We sat here in 2011, 12, and you were talking about a residential marketplace. We all remember what rents were like. We all remember the vacancy level at that stage. And yet, at that point in time, PII and various other bodies were calling for stock to be constructed. So I suppose we need to have the use of that data to drive delivery into the future and to drive policy into the future because we've had implications of policy reactions put in place which have had less than positive impact, let's be honest, on the marketplace. Your ask of government, John. Yeah, so I, I suppose two things, uh, Ivan. The, the, the first thing is that I think government needs to... Uh, fortify its skill sets on property and particularly housing within the system. So government departments and state agencies, uh, I think, need to recruit people with savoir faire and experience and long term. What are you talking about? Technical engineering yeah, or um, yeah. uh, technology? What, what are you talking about? People that have actually been involved in development and really thoroughly understand it. because I'm, it, I'm trying to work out who you're getting at here. Is it well, planners not, or is it... Uh, well, take, take the Department of Housing, for example. You know, there is, because these are civil servants, they're building their careers by moving between departments and they get promoted and they move on and the institutional knowledge that they have is gone and they may be replaced by somebody who, who doesn't necessarily have any experience in development or housing. So we have a heavily lobbied... Um, issue here. You've got, you know, the likes of IIP and PII and the, and, um, the construction sector all lobbying heavily. You've got political pressures coming from opposition. So there's a lot of pressure 
on people making housing policy. And what they really need to do is, I think it's quite right and appropriate in a pluralist system that you do have lobbying, and, and I, I've I absolutely nothing against it. And you, that's where ideas come from. But equally, you need uh, a, a, a state system that has its own ideas and is able to sift through all of these proposals well, that, that, that really are pitched. resonates with his point yeah. about data and planning. Exactly. And sorry, okay. Ivan, the, the second point yes. I, I would say is we do still need better data. We've had 351,000 additional households since 2011. Uh, the housing stock has risen by about 129,000 units. What we don't really know is how much vacant stock was absorbed to help fill in the remainder of that gap. Do you know, because yeah. we haven't got an accurate read on the vacancy rate either yeah. in 2011 or 2022, and we're no closer really to getting that, and there are plenty of examples like that where we're having to formulate policy, and people uh, within the industry are having to make their business plans in the dark. Okay. Yeah. Right. Um, Ivan, I suppose first and foremost, um, we keep hearing that we're in the midst of a housing crisis and a climate crisis. Okay. And the RII came out last week, the Royal Institute of Architects, and they said that social housing isn't affordable, and affordable housing, is, or sorry, uh, sustainable housing isn't affordable, and affordable yeah. housing isn't sustainable. Right. That, that looks like a systemic issue. So government has to intervene, and there's a number of ways. I, I know the SESI have come up with various suggestions over the years of ways they can intervene in terms of expansion of finance to make it more viable, uh, removal of some of the barriers that are already there. I'm not going to rehash any of that. But what I will say is we've had recent examples of how you treat a crisis uh, in the example of the, the global pandemic. And we had an Irishman who stood up and said, speed trumps perfection. So I'm going to slightly conflict with my two colleagues and say, we do need the data, 100%. You can only make good decisions with data. But, but Mike, um, his name escapes me at the moment, uh, the, the guy from the WHO, Ryan. Mike Ryan, Mike Ryan came out and said, speed trumps perfection. Okay? If, you, if you have to wait to be right, you're probably too late. And I do think we need more passionate um, and, 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 and more direct intervention from government in the meantime. Because there's, they seem to be afraid of making mistakes. Well, the good news is they've been making mistakes for years, right? These might be better mistakes. Um, that's my okay. You, you've been asking Pat the final word to you for more certainty. Certainty in which yeah. direction? Yeah. The Mariah Carey tune is humming in my head. All I want for Christmas. <laughs> um, first of all, we do need to tackle the planning issue. Um, the minister keeps using the phrase "radical" to describe the reform that the Attorney General's office is sponsoring. I hope it is, uh, because we have 35,000 units at the moment held up in judicial reviews and they're badly needed in the market. Uh, the second thing is we need to tackle the viability issue. I won't repeat what I said already, but I, I think there are things can be done there. And the third one is policy stability. If we take the whole rental market, I mean, there's been four interventions in the course of about two years from RPZs, rent pressure zones, to um, a, a cap to uh, uh, linked inflation to a 2% cap, and now uh, stay on evictions. And all that that's doing is, it's providing limited short-term certainty to people who currently rent, and it's utterly destructive for the people who are badly trying to access the rental market because they're the ones that need the new supply. Uh, and in the moment, uh, all of those interventions are actually damaging the supply pipeline. Uh, so they're the kind of things that would be on my agenda heading into 2023. Okay. We're going to take a deeper dive, please, into all of those areas uh, in terms of housing, commercial property, state intervention, and so on. Uh, I'd like, uh, before I introduce our next speaker, who's coming to us from New Zealand, um, I'd just like to, on your behalf, thank Owen, Enda, Pat, and John. A lot of expertise, a lot of high-level thinking here. Thank you very much indeed. Thank you.